You're listening to the Full Circle Music Show, the why of the music biz. Hey guys, welcome to the Full Circle Music Show. This is Chris Murphy alongside Seth Mosley. How you doing, buddy? Good, man. How are you? I'm awesome. I'm awesome. I'm really excited because we had Reed Shippen in the studio uh, for an interview and just got so much out of talking to him. Like, you guys would know Reed from uh, producing or mixing uh, everybody from Kenny Chesney, Little Big Town, Keith Urban. He's got seven Grammys to his name. How would it feel to have seven Grammys to your name? That's amazing. I'm working on it. I've got, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm one seventh of the way there. <laughs> You'll get there. As soon as possible, I know that. If I keep working with guys like Reed, then maybe. Absolutely. He's got one with India Ari, uh, which was uh, pretty impressive as well. So his resume goes way beyond just country uh, or Christian music as well. He, he's, he's been across the board, so I uh, got so much out of it. What was that one thing that we were talking about? Well, today he, he kind of uh, informed us of a, a term he came up with called no such thing as musical emergencies. I thought that was really interesting in the light of keeping priorities straight, uh, in respect to family, work-life balance. Um, but that's not to take away from the fact that this guy makes amazing records at every single thing that he works on. Absolutely. He goes full bore with everything that he does, including keeping his priorities in check. And we can't wait to hear what you think about the episode, so let's dive right into the interview with Reed Shippen. Thanks for the time, man. We, we appreciate you making the drive. You're, you're, in, you're in Nashville for all the listeners out there, and we're in a little town called Franklin, which is practically Alabama <laughs> <laughs> to read. It's, it's an honor for me to have uh, Reed on the show, because when I first moved to Nashville, which was what we talked about 2008, 2009, Reed was one of the first guys that I got to work with and kind of sit behind and watch what he's doing on some of these projects that I had the opportunity to produce on. And the thing that, I, that really stood out to me was, and I don't even know if you remember saying this or not, but I probably I, not. I still take it with me today is that it was with a, a manager in the room and he was doing all these tweaks. And I was kind of, I didn't know how the whole thing works. And I'm like, so is Reed like the, like the guy who like, did you get to do any tweaks or is it like what he does? Is that the mix? You know? And, um, the thing that I think after he left and we were just hanging out, you were like, yeah, this is the service industry. And it's really about serving artists and managers and labels. And that's what really stuck out to me. So that's a big part of why I wanted to have you on our, our show, just because sure. it, it very much has informed the way that we've done things over the past, you know, six years or so. Yeah, well, cool. Well, thanks for thanks for having me here. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know that any that everybody agrees with that philosophy. But for me, it's always been, I mean, I say that a hundred times a, a week where it's like, man, it's you know what? At the end of the day, it's your record. You know, I, we get to listen to it for weeks or months or days or however, but man, those, they're going to live with it for their whole life. And it's their statement. Like it's got to be right for them. Yeah. You know, so that's that. Yeah. I've, I've always tried to, to approach this from a zero ego perspective and, you know, just try and make the best possible thing until, you know, until somebody does something that's really, really stupid. And, <laughs> and then you try and guide them away from that as much as possible. From your perspective, do you think that that's something that, uh, as far as Nashville goes, that that's the general mentality of being a service uh, or being a servant of the product or the artist? Or is that something that's kind of more unique to you? I, I mean, I, hopefully with the I mean, the people I try and hang out with, you know, <laughs> yeah. like there's definitely a vibe. More and more people are moving here and I got a lot of friends from LA that are here. And, and, you know, the one thing that they always say is like, man, Nashville's, everyone's so cool. And people are like, you know, they're so open and they want to invite you to come and hang out. And like, they, they say, oh man, you know what? I, I can't do that gig, but you should do it. Or, you know, you should call this guy cause he's really good. And he's like, that doesn't happen in LA. Now I'm sure it does, but by and large, Nashville seems more of a just like a small community and like everyone's cool with each other. Like we were just talking about, it. it's like, Oh man, you should get with this guy and write. And you guys, you know, you guys would be fantastic and all that instead of just like, these are my writers and those are your writers. And mm, yeah, you know, it's form our own clubs kind of thing. It's <laughs> life's too short. So you're in Nashville. How long have you been in Nashville? What, what got you here? I've been here forever. Um, I, uh, I moved down here to finish school. I was going to I was going to school for uh, I started going to college for electrical engineering and accounting, and then decided I'd rather be poor and interested than bored and you know secure. So sure. I I bailed on all that and moved down here to. That do is music. gold right there. Poor uh, and interested rather than bored and secure. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> write that. We'll down. that and tweet it. Yeah, go for it. Um, you know, I mean, and it took a while. It took a while for me to to get my parents to realize. You know, my, like my grandmother would always be like, "Music's a avocation, not a vocation." Sure. And you know, that was it. Was always like, "What are you going to fall back on? Like, what's going to be the 
backup plan. And I was like, there is no backup plan. Uh-huh. So they were, uh, they kept up with that until the Grammy started showing up. And then they were like, <laughs> oh, this is not a lot of people get those. I was like, yeah, I guess not. And they're like, oh, this is maybe a job. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have a Grammy, and I don't know if my parents still think it's a job or not. Maybe, <laughs> what's the Grammy threshold of how many that you have? I don't you? know, man. <laughs> you know, like, I, I, I'm, I'm actually on the board of the Grammys now, so they hate it when I say this, but I, I'm, I always say a Grammy and $4 gets you a latte. <laughs> um, you know, it's great to get the recognition. It sure. is. But, you know, at the end of the day, it's, it's just about doing good work. So I moved down here from New Jersey to MTSU. It was the only school I could afford. I went to school full-time. I worked full-time time put myself through that then started doing the thing that doesn't exist anymore which is uh like interning and then assisting and that turned into engineering and mixing came really early in that process and i kind of fell into that and and i've been doing a lot of that ever since now with that um you 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 sped up there and said that all of these things led up to uh, where you are now but what was that length of time and process from starting interning until you were who you are now I'm still the same guy I was back then. Just well, I, I guess maybe, trying to learn um, from an experience standpoint. When were you ready to uh, take the reins? Versus, um, I'm still not ready. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, you know, I mean, I started working on records in the mid to late '90s as I was coming out of school. I honestly kind of barely graduated because I was working at studios downtown and, you know, driving on on the highway at like six in the morning and half asleep and almost dying on a couple of occasions. And every time I was in school, I was like, man, I'm missing a session. Like, do I really need to be here? So, um, but got the diploma, sent it home to my mom. It's the last time I used it, (laughs) you know, um, holds more weight than the Grammy. Yeah. You know, I don't know. It's, it's a good thing. It's college was a good experience for, uh, learning different stuff. I mean, I honestly, I just got a ton of studio time. Like, you know, thousands of hours in the studio there just trying to learn. So mid to late nineties, I guess, um, started working on records and assisting. Um, I assisted one guy in particular, a guy named Rick will for like three solid years. I went back and looked at the schedule charts that I kept and I was averaging 16 hours a day, seven days a week for like three years. Gosh, you know, it was a lot of work. So that, that adds up your uh, 10,000 hours much quicker if you're yeah probably (laughs) so um from that late 1990s to when you were the when was the first record that you were credited as as mixer or producer or you know something that you were oh man i should have done my research you know what i think the first one i was credited as mixer on was grits factors of the seven which was a christian hip-hop record these two great guys um stacy and Tarang. And uh, Rick Robbins and Otto Price, I think, were producers on that. And I was the assistant, actually, and they had hired this really great mixer, a guy named John Yash, uh, to to do the songs. And I guess they had only had enough money or enough time for him to do, like, three or whatever. So one of the other producers on the record, Todd Collins, was like, well, I'll just mix the rest of it. But he didn't know how to use the studio. Mm. So I was just like, well, you know, I knew... I knew Todd was kind of lazy. Sorry, Todd. And I was like, well, why don't I just, why don't I just do a tune? Because if you hate it, you're going to have to, I'll have it done when you get here. If you hate it, you're going to have to redo it anyway. No time loss. But if, you know, if you like it, why the heck not? So I did it and he really liked it. And I ended up doing the rest of that record. And, you know, that was the beginning of that process. Wow. So that initiative... Like, not asking for permission. You just went and did it. Oh, I'm a big fan of forgiveness rather than permission, <laughs> um, even now. But, uh, and, and then that, that was, I started doing some stuff for Goatee, and, and, and then Charlie Peacock called me, as he has called so many young people in, the, in this town, and said, hey, I've got an idea. Let's, let's, mix a, let's mix a record for this band called Avalon. And it was this record called A Maze of Grace. And I, I was like, Charlie, I'm not qualified to do this. And he's like, yeah, I know. It'll be fun. You know, <laughs> so let's do it. And um, I still, to this day, have no idea why he called me to do that. But um, that record was really successful in the CCM industry. And, um, and that kind of kicked off the, that was, that was my calling card as far as like people said, oh, well, this has a lot of hits on it. And, you know, it sounds really good or whatever. And we can trust him to like work on our music. So yeah. that was, that's where that all came from. And then. For many years since it was it was CCM CCM City interspersed with some some pop and some R and B and stuff like that. 
it you know a lot of people just look at Nashville as just this big country town uh, from an out, outsider's perspective, but that is a large part of the community here is in music is the CCM community mm-hmm. and that as well. Well, those were kind of the two options when I came down here, and I was from New Jersey. Like I, I you know, I grew up on uh, New York radio and on East Coast hip hop, native tongues, and and all that rock stuff and all the all that cool music, you know. And uh, I had never really heard country music i didn't really know anything about it so when i got down here i gravitated toward the stuff that was very similar to what i listened to which was pop and rock and at the time you know ccm music was was very uh very diverse and doing all kinds of different stuff so uh that was kind of a natural fit sure in fact i've been i've been in this town 20 years before i worked on a country record wow just weird that is weird (laughs) and and fast forward to today we were kind of just talking before before the interview that's kind of your main gig nowadays right is in the country space yeah i get a I, there's a lot of i get a lot of country music across my desk yeah, yeah i mean he's working on some artists like dirks bentley right now eric pasley uh any others that we should know about at the moment kenny chesney lady annabellum um you know the the little big town stuff i've done stuff with eric church and shania twain and like all kinds of I wish we would have got on the show who had some something on his resume. I mean, you know. <laughs> I know we'll, we'll keep digging, we'll keep trying. <laughs> well, I just I kind of stumbled into country, honestly, and 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 I mean, just from my vantage point, how what was the transition there? What was the the uh, the spark that lit the powder keg in in that in that sense? Um, uh, Jay Joyce. Uh, Jay, I had known Jay, I've known Jay probably since I was like 17. Like I, he was in a part of the rock and roll crowd that I met when I was just a fledgling here in this town, like that whole crew. And, um, he's, he's a ridiculous talent, like an insanely great producer, songwriter, guitar player was then still is now like amazing. So for whatever reason I worked on, I worked on some Eric Church stuff, a record called Carolina that I got to mix. And then he got an opportunity to do a record with this band called Little Big Town. And long story short on that, we went into the studio, cut the whole record in like three and a half days. Wow. Um, almost everything was live and mixed it. And, you know, they were a band that was supposedly on the downslope of their career. And that record hit really, really hard and kind of blew them back up. And, you know, all of a sudden I was getting calls for country music because people liked the way it sounded. And we, and we had deliberately not, we had deliberately made it, a left turn sonically on that. You and know? how how much of that? Because you said you tracked and mixed that record. I did. Yeah. How much of that are you doing nowadays versus just mixing? And how much do you think that has to do with that? That record had its own sonic footprint was by you being involved in the tracking process and the mixing process. I mean, I like to think that it that had a lot to do with it. I mean, it also has a lot to do with Jay and his process and just the band that we put together and all that. But it's certainly easier to to control sonic stuff when you're starting it and i i actually like to paint myself into corners when i'm recording like because it's i mean take chances and do things a little bit differently and you know uh, maybe that's one of the reasons why i I get called to do stuff is because it's it's not safe like i don't like doing stuff safe (laughs) what gave you the confidence to be able to step out and to to take chances like that oh i'm still as insecure as anyone else you know it's just uh I mean, how can you not really? It's you're, you know, you're you're making music. You're especially as a, as an engineer or someone who's involved at least some in the production process. I mean, your your job is to inspire the artist to give a really great performance, and to do that, you need, you know, especially when you're dealing with live musicians, you need to get them inspired. And these guys, these guys are fantastic. The musicianship in this town is insane. You know, I mean, it's really untouchable. These guys are are scary, scary good. But they also they do a lot of 10 to 6 sessions and demos and same thing here play the demo read the chart play the demo read the chart so you know it's like if if we're going to go in and make a record i like to screw with them you know to let them know hey you know what rules are off like yeah you know cuz i mean they, they'll bring the great stuff anyway and it's like that's cool and brian sutton is one of the best acoustic guitar players on the planet bar none the guy's insane cool let's run him through an amp because when he hears that, he's like, oh, okay. And he's going to play differently because now it's okay to like, 
you know, go off the reservation a little bit. Or, you know, um, also I've noticed that musicians get really, really inspired when someone's in there going, dude, I don't, I don't want a guitar sound. I want an awesome guitar sound. Let's try this. Let's try that. I brought this pedal. Let's try this. What if we change that way? Same with drummers and putting inspiring stuff in their headphones. And I run stuff through Moogs and delays and distortion and like trying to give them different things to react to. And, and they love that. So the playing reflects that and ends up being a better record. So, I mean, I kind of think that's part of the gig. I guess what I'm, I'm thinking here from maybe someone that's listening, that's beginning this process and they may be, they may have instincts, but don't know to trust them yet. And it doesn't sound like that you've been one to follow the rules or to, to go with the norm, even from the beginning that you just, you know, took on mixing that song yourself. Uh, so what would you say to somebody to give them the confidence to trust their instincts and just to go with it and see where it, see where they can explore? Well, one of the beauties of, of the way a lot of music gets done today, I mean, we're sitting in a, in a studio here, like no one's sitting over your shoulder in Seth's studio saying, hey, look, you need to get this work done, man, because it's $1,800 today. And, you know, I mean, back in the day, um, or even still on some of these records, you know, we cut the entire, we cut 11 sides on Dirks like a week and a half, two weeks ago in three days. Um, and they weren't three long days. Which, 11 songs in three days. Yeah. 11 wow. songs in three days, full instrumentation. That speaks to the musicianship. Oh my gosh. Nashville. These guys are just, they're, they're, they're actually so good that producers, you know, don't realize how good these guys are. You know, like I almost want to be like, do a rock band once. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. You know, like, you know, cause these guys, I mean, they, you describe what you want and they play it. And then you say, well, let's change this and that and this and that. And they play it and it's yeah. right. And you're just like, oh, really? I just need to go work at Starbucks. Yeah. <laughs> like seriously, I'm not even, I'm never going to call myself a musician in this town like ever. <laughs> anyway, um, you know, you, I mean, you have the ability to, to sit here and, and, and mess with stuff and, uh, and anybody can do boring. What, what's interesting about boring? Like name, name me your top five boring records, like favorite boring <laughs> records. And nobody wants to, they always want to go for something that has something like unique and interesting. So go for unique and interesting. I mean, you can always back off it. Sure. You know? Yeah. In the, in, in today's world where, cause you've been involved in two industries in country and, and CCM, um, from what I know of them, they actually are a at least very radio driven format. Yes. Yeah. And there are quote unquote rules to abide by. Do you how much of that plays into your mind when you're when you're in the process and in the trenches thinking, okay, is this gonna work? Is this not gonna work? It's always a balance, you know. Um you learn through a lot of trial and error and experience what works on radio and what doesn't work on radio, um, you know, and and it's, sometimes it's difficult because there's, for a lot of people, they, they want stuff that doesn't work on radio, and it's a bummer to be the guy that's like, yeah, that's a really cool idea. However, that's going to suck on radio. Like, if you want it to sound like that, I'll totally do it. But just trust me, because your song's going to come on in between these two other songs that I did, <laughs> and... You know, if you, I don't want you calling me later saying, "Hey, how come my song doesn't sound like?" Well, it's like, you know, I mean, there are there are some rules, um, and radios radios a tough radios a tough beast because they mangle audio and you know, and honestly, different formats and especially as you get into, I don't know that CCM deals with this, but as you get into pop, especially, there's like multiple formats and multiple segments of formats and drive time stuff and stations sound different and different you know, times of day and, mm. and like even tempos, crazy. right? Like a lot of PDs are speeding up and slowing down songs and yeah, man, yeah. they, they add reverb to stuff. They time compress it and expand it. And you know, it's, it's kind of a mess, but I, you know, it's the necessary evil for certain segments of that. It's like population. a, it's like a filet mignon in a microwave, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, kind of the, it can be. Yeah. Yeah, it can be. Wow. Um, but you know, that is what it is. And, and I mean, it's also chasing trends. So, Country music, the perfect example, is two weeks ago, everyone was about this, and then Chris Stapleton, like, tore it up on the CMAs, and now everyone's about that. And that's, yeah. I mean, that's cool. That's that's part of the music industry. Um, you still try and make great art, because, I mean, ask Adele. Yeah. She did okay with her single. She's kind of so. doing it, you know, her way. So, yeah. Yeah. it's always a balance. Yeah. Well, you obviously are having success in the biz, but there are a lot of people out there that that talk about that the, the industry is dead and that there's there's nothing to be uh, to found. Every treasure has been 
um, dug through and all the all the gold is gone. But you you're you're making a living. You're doing what you do and um, doing it on your terms. What do you say to those people out there that are saying that the industry is dead? I'm I'm always curious when that comes up as to their frame of reference. Um, you know, I know I've talked to a lot of guys who were around when the music industry was drug money, you know, and everyone was making insane amounts of money. And when you ask them now, they're like, oh yeah, the music industry's dead. Sure. So, you know, it's the, it's the, I saw a great article the other day um, uh, about, you know, do you want to make a dent or do you want to own the industry? Because you don't have to own the industry. Like not everyone's going to be McDonald's, not everyone's going to be Apple, but that doesn't mean that you're unemployed and homeless either. Right. So, you know, you find your niche and you make a dent and that dent can be pretty good yeah you know so i mean i think i think right now there's a lot more there's way more music than ever before there's a lot more opportunity than ever before um no one's going to sell you know 20 million records um and that's just the way it is but honestly i think that that if you look at the way the music industry was structured um with cds and rebuying of catalog and and just like the whole the structure of it as a whole it uh it was a bubble and if you look through the history of economics, you can identify bubbles. And I mean, there's there's been bubbles in internet and equities and real estate, and like you know, see what bubbles happen. But you know, when the bubbles pop, it's not like real estate. When the real estate bubble popped in 2008, it's not like real estate went away. Sure, it all of a sudden just didn't become in. It wasn't insanely lucrative, unless you were smart enough to be smart in 2008, which I wasn't. I wish I had bought like. Everything. Way more stuff in yeah. 2008. In fact, in fact, a friend of mine, a friend of mine, reminded me. He's like, "Do you remember in 2008 where we were like, we should just be buying everything right now?" He's like, "We were really stupid." <laughs> you know? Well, um, if you're if you're like me, you're kind of waiting for the next one, which I even think is going to be a bigger bubble pop than the last one. So we're kind of just waiting, holding out for that. So. Yeah, I mean, it's just this is this is the way human economics work on in multiple businesses. So. Yeah, the music industry had a really nice bubble, and now we're going back to what the music industry was when the Beatles first got started, which is singles-driven, um, you know, artist-driven, lots of music out there, and every once in a while, you know, somebody makes something amazing, and like Adele's Adele's record's gonna just total all expectation as far as sales goes. So I think there's a lot of opportunity out there, and there's a lot of decent money to be made. But I mean, if you want to get rich, don't go go run a hedge fund, man. Don't get in the music industry. Yeah, you know, get in the music industry and make music. Yeah. That's, so I guess good. for those haters, it's nice if if they're running away. That just means more opportunity for you. Well, it's it's kind of the the middle class is getting creamed, you know? So there's opportunity for a lot of people who can do stuff fast and cheap and good. And there's opportunity for people who, you know, who can like occupy the top tier of stuff, but like the middle class, which was, you know, the people that were okay at their job and they were doing okay stuff. Well, there's, there's just not much room for okay right now. So they're getting decimated. Yeah. People, labels and artists and, and managers are looking for, yeah, like you said, a deal or they're looking for the, the guy, the top guy and, 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 Reed is definitely be uh, becoming and really is at this point one of those top tier. You hear about that um, twenty eighty rule: twenty percent of people are doing eighty percent of all the work. It's probably more like three ninety seven. <laughs> the know. Pareto principle, yeah, the Pareto large. Principle. Yeah, <laughs> so Reed is one of in the country space. I mean, there's only you can probably count them on one hand of of guys that are doing what he's doing at the level that he's doing it at. So. I would I would echo that that's even been my experience in um, my shorter time in Nashville. It's give, getting more and more so that way. I guess so. I, I mean, I'm I consider myself very fortunate to have the the uh, the opportunities that I have, and I work really hard to try and make things really like really really awesome. And I care. Um, and that's and that's uh, that's one of the things that I think we all have to guard against. Like, it's really really easy to just be like, ah, screw it. This is fine. Like this is okay. Sure. And I'd almost I'd rather have someone be like, "Hey, man, you went way too far on this." Than for them to be like, "Yeah, it's good. It's good." Mm. You know, yeah. I, I'd rather work for people who really want to dig in and like really want to make something great. Than it's like, "Yeah, this is fine. Yeah, it's going. Yeah, it's whatever. Who cares?" Yeah. Like that yeah. uh, drives me crazy. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Man. Do you have a moment in your career that it it may not have uh, equaled uh, more? plaques on the wall or something like that. But that moment where you're like, we nailed this and I'm really proud of this. Do you have that, that big thing that you can look back on and it said, I don't care about all the accolades. I did this and this was amazing. 
I get. I mean, you kind of look for those moments on an everyday basis. The uh, uh, I call it touching the third rail. I mean, very few people got into music because, well, I guess a lot of people got into music because it's cool and you can get chicks, right? You know, sure. but uh, uh, yeah, that's why you play guitar, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but you know, I mean, everybody's kind of looking for that moment. And I was just reading like Glenn Johns's book and, and, you know, you're like, man, he was sitting there when they're, when they're playing like, you know, brown sugar, like you had, you had to know that that was amazing. Yeah. Every once in a while. And sometimes it's not even something that's, that's ever successful, but you get into that thing where the speakers disappear and you're just like, man, this is exactly why I do this. Like, this is awesome. Sure. Um, so yeah, I mean that's happened a couple of times. Every once in a while, you get a great record with great people. That's just so much fun and so easy, and it feels like everyone's pushing everybody to be better, and no one's, you know, like not caring or pissed off or like fighting or you know. I mean, everything just seems synergistic, and that's those are really really awesome records to work on. Yeah, man, I wish I could sit here and talk all day. Uh, but as we wrap up here, I'm thinking back of you trying to talk or to about you trying to talk your parents into moving down to Nashville and going to school and uh, dropping everything else. Um, and thinking about that guy that may be out there in that same boat right now of knowing that he's got a dream that he wants to do or her, uh, what advice would you give them to either keep in their head or to tell their parents when they're going to make that leap, regardless of what the, the folks say? Well, I mean, as a parent now myself, like, uh, 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 the Bible says, you know, raise your kids up in the way that they should go, right? I believe that's a yeah. that's a Bible quote. And yeah. I think a lot of people read into that saying, like, tell your kids that this is the right right thing to do. But the way I see it is identify that the, the talents that your kids have mm. and try and fan those flames as much as possible because that's the way they should go. You know, that's that's what they need. And, and uh, um, my parents didn't do a great job of doing that, to be honest. I had to figure that out for myself, which was very difficult. Sure. Um, you know, I would... I'm going to make sure that my kids get that from me as much as possible. But, you know, I mean, you have to, you got to do what you love because you get one trip on this planet. Yeah. So if you're spending your life doing something that you hate, you're wasting it. You know, you got to go for it. So, and who cares if it makes money or doesn't make money? If you, if you love what you do, you never work a day in your life. There you go. So, I mean, that's, yeah, it's, that's the you know, motivational poster type of talk, but <laughs> yeah. it's totally true. <laughs> yeah, I, we we live by that all the time, and I, we we have um, a daughter now, and I'm <laughs> a while ago I was thinking, okay, I, I, pl please God, don't let her go into music. Please God, don't let her go into music. <laughs> but honestly, it's what you said. I mean, if it, if it's what they love and it's what they do, yeah, fan the flame and don't worry so much about the the money. It, honestly, I I would always rather look back knowing that I tried something and it didn't work rather than knowing I didn't try something and it might have worked. Yeah. You know? so. But at the same time, you know, especially now you have to be an entrepreneur. You have to go into this eyes wide open. You have to plan. You have to think. You have to be strategic and, and be smart about it. It's it's not like, you know, you know, three chords and the truth are is isn't necessarily business plan. Sure. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you, you gotta you gotta think about that stuff too. Because the people that are gonna be successful in the music business now and going forward are the people that are their own business. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's not, there's not enough room now to uh, rely on other people to do that stuff for you. You know, the people who fail are like, oh, well, my manager didn't do this, or my attorney didn't do this, or my producer didn't do this. The people who succeed are the guy, the, the, the guys and girls that are like, this is what I want. And, you know, they, and they get it, man. I, some of these, and some of these guys that I get to work with, Kenny Chesney is the hardest working person I've ever met in my life. Hmm. Wow. That guy is killing it and yeah. you know i get calls from him at six in the morning or midnight or at two in the morning all the time and he's like hey man i'm hitting the gym at 5 30 i had an idea for a song can i stop by the studio at seven and tweak it wow. real quick and he'll come in we'll mess with something he'll be like cool thanks bud gone seven twenty. he's off to something else gosh like he's he's killing it yeah but he has to because yeah. he's running he's running like six businesses and yeah. doing a really good job you yeah. know it's it's amazing got a schedule to fly back out to that island <laughs> I don't think he gets to spend as much time there as 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 he wants to, but yeah, I'll take up a a, a point share or something if I need to to spend some time. Just yeah, keeping up the 
gardens. Or something. I was, yeah, I was, I was like, man, you know, we should maybe think about doing a record on the island. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which is the beauty of technology nowadays is you can do it anywhere, right? Yeah, you can pretty much you can pretty much do it anywhere. I mean, it depends on what you're trying to capture and how you're trying to capture it and all that. And, you know, there are, there are certain there are still certain things that are impossible to do in a bedroom, but. Um, yeah, I mean, you can, you can get really, really high quality stuff almost anywhere. Yeah. You can get really, really low quality stuff almost anywhere yeah. too. <laughs> and I deal with that on a regular basis as well. But yeah, no, it's, it's uh, it's pretty freeing. You can do music wherever you want. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. It, to, it, to, as we're kind of wrapping up, I mean, one thing to piggyback, um, as a question on your last point to say, okay, Kenny swings by studio five thirty. blah, blah, blah. How have you managed to have a life and music at the same time? Because uh, this might not be a, a question for the person starting out, because I, I'm a very big believer, and you can tell me if you agree with this or not, that at the beginning you've just got to grind it and grind it and grind sure. it until something happens. Yeah. But then once it does happen, you know, how do you have a life and be a dad and be a husband or, you know? I mean, you just you just force it. Like my my two favorite phrases are: "There's no such thing as a musical emergency," and uh, "Lack of preparation on your part doesn't constitute an emergency on my part." <laughs> um, it, it, it just uh, I I I'm discovered that I get that I get more done between eight a.m. and noon than I get done between noon and eight. And you just have to be ruthless about like, okay, I'm gonna get up, I'm gonna have breakfast with my kids, I'm gonna work out, I'm gonna go to the studio, I'm gonna crush it. I don't do lunch. I don't you know do whatever if my girls are in ballet two nights a week those are the nights i might go have a late meeting and then i'm home you know or just work late on other ones like there's stuff that's inviolable i don't work weekends um unless it's unless it's just in inhuman schedule mess up you know yeah. um like friday nights or pizza in a movie night and you know it's having kids is is uh it's about having routines that they can that they can rely on, and you know you have to be around because I'm not going to be the guy who, you know, loses their entire life just because they're making records. You can do both if you work hard. Yeah. Yeah, but so. Well, that's great. Yeah, that's encouraging. I think from from my vantage point. Yeah. So me as well. Reed, thank you so much. Man, thank you. This, this was fun. Yeah, absolutely. Very cool. Hey, we hope you've enjoyed this episode and will join us again soon on the Full Circle Music Show, the why of the music is. Check us out at fullcirclemusic.org slash podcast. 